This video contains adult language and themes. Your discretion is advised. Hello everyone, I'm Uncle Mark, and thank you for watching. Now, as you can tell by my age, I am a child of the 70s, so I have many memories of the music of that time. For example, I remember getting my first record player for my 8th birthday, or was it Christmas? You know, they're three days apart, and I would always get told that this is your birthday present and your Christmas present. Do I sound bitter? The first single that I got with it was Touch Me in the Morning by Diana Ross. Now that's a great song and it helped establish my love of soul music of the 70s, but it's not appropriate for an eight-year-old. A couple of years later, I joined the Columbia Record House. You remember that? Eight records for one penny plus shipping. And I had no way of paying for anything else that would come in automatically because I didn't get an allowance and what 10-year-old understands contract law. After that, I discovered American Top 40 and the obsessive compulsive list keeper in me became obsessively compulsed with keeping lists. Now, as far as the music itself, I seemed to like pretty much anything back then except for maybe hard rock and heavy metal. I didn't have any discernible taste and I didn't pay attention to what critics would say was good or bad. In fact, to this day, there are still some truly bad songs that I have a fondness for. But there are plenty of other bad songs that I have no qualms about criticizing, considering that there were 253 number one songs that decade, there are many to choose from. Now, my opinions are my own, and your mileage will vary, as I am sure some of your least favorite number ones will not be on this list. Let me know in the comments which songs are your least favorites, and eh, who knows, maybe we can have a fun discussion about those. And don't forget to click the like button if you enjoy this video, ring the bell for future notifications, and please subscribe to my channel. And now that we've got the preliminaries over with, Let's get started with my choices for the top 10 worst number one songs of the 70s. Now, what makes a song bad? Sometimes the singing is poor or even completely off key. Sometimes the lyrics are laughable or cringeworthy. Sometimes the production can be low quality or messy, or sometimes it could be a combination of two or even all three of these. But what if all three elements are at least passable? Well, in the case of my number 10 song, it's just that. Passable. There's nothing memorable, nothing outstanding. It just exists. And to be the least memorable number one song of the 70s, it's got to be a special kind of Bland. It's cold here in the city. It always seems that way. Now, John Denver for me is anything but bland. He had a total of four number one songs in the 70s with Sunshine on My Shoulder, Thank God I'm a Country Boy, Annie Song, and this one. Let's not forget, he had many other classics such as Rocky Mountain High and Calypso. In fact, Calypso was originally the flip side of the single of I'm Sorry, and when it was released as a single, it managed to reach number two with I'm Sorry as its flip side. Now, when the B-side not only becomes a hit, but is considered one of John's best and most beloved songs, and the A-side becomes a forgotten relic even after it hits number one, that's not good. There are many times when I think someone gets too popular and they can release anything and it can get to number one. And this is one of those times. It's a standard breakup song with John lamenting how heartbroken he is about what he did and how things ended and how he wishes he could make it up and get her back. But other than this line about China, I'm sorry for the way things are in China. It's completely generic. It's breakup song number 14,528. And it is so disappointing to hear such a great singer and songwriter just phoning it in. There are so many more songs that I could have put in this spot, but as bad as they are, you can't forget them. I'm sorry I don't remember this song even after I started compiling this list, but I'm not sorry for putting it here.
Back in the 1970s, it seemed any musical act could end up with a network variety show. Do you kids even remember variety shows? Christ, I'm old. Now, people will remember shows that starred Sonny and Cher, Diane Marie, even Tony Orlando and Dawn. But who else remembers shows that starred The Captain and Tennille, Bobby Vinton, The Manhattan Transfer? But all those acts managed multiple hits. Whereas in 1977, this act managed to get a show on the basis of their one and only hit, which also got them two Grammys. And it also got number one on Todd and the Shadows' Worst Songs of 1976. It's only number nine here. Gonna find my baby, gonna hold her tight, gonna grab some afternoon delight. My motto's always been when it's right, it's right. Why wait until the middle of a cold, dark night? As it turns out, two married members of the Starland vocal band co-wrote with our number 10, John Denver, Take Me Home, Country Roads, which is now the state song of West Virginia. That duo, Bill Danoff and Taffy Nivert, had tried recording under a couple of different names with no luck. It wasn't until they joined up with John Carroll and Margot Chapman, who would later marry each other, and form the band with which they found success. The inspiration for the song came from a happy hour menu, and Bill decided to write a song about sex while trying to straddle the line between overt and coy. Well, that's your problem. The year before, Donna Summer released Love to Love You Baby, the 18-minute ode to female orgasms that reached number two, and if you try to compare that, or Tonight's the Night from Rod Stewart, or anything by Barry White or Marvin Gaye alongside this, there's no comparison. This comes off naive, tame, and laughably campy, with the bizarrely cheerful singing sounding as though Up With People was recording this. And to have lyrics that compare genitalia to worms and fishing tackle? Started out this morning feeling so polite I always thought a fish could not be caught It didn't fight But you got some bait awaiting And I think I might like Never in a little afternoon delight Gross. Ironically, for all the loving they sing about, the two couples would end up divorcing. Sometimes I wonder if the song could be saved if it was remade by, say, Lil Nas X and Megan Thee Stallion. Now those two could add some raunchiness that is much needed. As it is, this song has all the sexiness of a Wonder Bread and Mayonnaise sandwich. And while we're on the subject of Wonder Bread and Mayonnaise, I can tell you've been hurt by that look on your face, girl. Some guy brought a sad to your happy world. The Osmonds made their first television appearance in 1962 and became regulars on The Andy Williams Show. Although they were popular on the show, it didn't translate to chart success as not one of their albums that they released in the 1960s even made it close to the Hot 200 album chart, and none of the singles came close to the Top 100. And once the 70s rolled around and they were in their teens, they decided to change their image and sound, much to the chagrin of their Mormon father. Future Republican Lieutenant Governor of California, Mike Kerb, signed them to MGM Records, and they traveled to Muscle Shoals to record with R&B producer Rick Hall. Now you might be asking yourself, R&B? The Osmonds? Who do they think they are? The Jackson 5? Yeah, that's exactly who they were trying to be. In fact, the songwriter George Jackson said that One Bad Apple was written in the style of Jackson 5, when he really should have said, Blatant ripoff of the Jackson 5. In reality, with its chirpy arrangements and vocals, it's much more bubblegum than R&B, even though it managed to reach number 6 on the R&B charts. Yes, the Osmonds on the R&B charts. And somehow the world didn't end. The harmony from the older brothers is okay, but once Donnie pipes in during the chorus with his puppy-like yowling... Oh, Ow, my ears! His screeching could turn off even his number one fan, Hortense Bird. And just for the record, their cartoon show is another ripoff from something the Jackson 5 did earlier. Now this song is rotten to the core. And yet we still have seven more songs to go. Oh, 
you don't hear remakes much anymore. I mean, once in a while you may have a cover that becomes a hit, but it seems like the only borrowing done nowadays is from sampling. In the 70s, though, covers were constantly on the charts, and quite a few of them managed to hit number one. And most of these were pretty bad. But for me, there is one cover that blows them all away. And I mean literally, I think the speakers were turned up to 11 when this one was recorded. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Come on, baby. Grand Funk Railroad were the nickelback of the 70s. You'll hear a lot of similarities between the two, especially in their first number one, We're an American Band, which is pretty much rock star. But that one isn't as sonically offensive as their remake of the Little Eva classic, whereas her version is a gentle invitation to get on the floor. This one practically body slams you like John Cena. <laughs> Todd Rundgren is normally a great producer, but everything in this record comes off muddy, sludgy, shouty, screechy, and just plain loud. Lead singer Mark Farner may not be a great singer, but he's Pavarotti compared to the background vocalists. Now, I wouldn't ask for subtlety or nuance from an arena rock band, but I would ask for something that resembles harmony or skill. <laughs> What the ever-loving fuck is this? I mean, fine, you want to change the bridge from a sax to a guitar solo, I understand, but this ineptitude is unlistenable. The only part of this song that I even enjoy is the piano that's playing underneath, but you only notice that part as the song is ending. This is badly produced, badly sung, badly played. But just like Nickelback, they became popular despite themselves. Pop singers creating Broadway musicals wasn't a thing in the 70s. Nowadays we have Elton John and the Lion King, Cyndi Lauper with Kinky Boots, Sarah Bareilles with Waitress, not to mention the countless jukebox musicals which have exploded in popularity. But in 1985, a musical called The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which was based on a Charles Dickens novel, hit Broadway and would go on to win the Tony for the Best Musical of the Year. Now, the creator of that musical managed to score the very last number one of the 70s. And it's a mystery to me how it even got popular. Now, I am going to go into a deep dive into these lyrics because there is so much to talk about. I was tired of my lady. Right off the bat, Rupert Holmes is telling us that his narrator is an asshole. Like a worn out recording of a favorite song. So if the recording is worn out, that doesn't mean you select a brand new song out of the blue and make it your new favorite, asshole. So while she lay there sleeping, I read the paper in bed. And in the personal columns, this letter I read. You're looking in the personals while she's sleeping next to you? Asshole! I didn't think about my lady. I know that sounds kind of mean. Kind of mean? Asshole. I've got to get you by tomorrow noon and cut through all this red tape. Okay, now this is just crappy writing trying to force a rhyme red tape like it's some kind of federal boondoggle I knew a smile in an instant I knew the curve of her face it was my own lovely lady oh now she's your lovely lady you're about to cheat on her asshole but now this brings us to her because he's not the only asshole in this relationship 
She took out the ad in the first place because she's just as tired of him and dissed him in the ad by saying he didn't have half a brain. If you're not So, let's say I'm this woman, and I'm ready to cheat on him, and I walk into the bar, and I see him. My first reaction wouldn't be, ah, it's you. And she said, ah, it's you. It would be, oh, it's you. Now, at that point, I would be looking for a good divorce lawyer, but instead, we have these two dysfunctional jerks somehow falling back in love with each other thanks to the power of pina coladas. These two deserve each other. Assholes. Yes, I like being a and getting caught in the rain. I'm not much into health food. Now, I am not going to go into the politics of this. But you may remember in 2022 when anti-vax right-wing truckers in Canada were protesting the border closure between the U.S. and Canada to try to prevent further spread of COVID, and a group of similarly-minded American truckers thought they could do the same and announced that they would head to D.C. and tie up traffic there indefinitely to show their clout and force the government to kowtow to their demands. But instead, they got fucked over by the notorious D.C. traffic and failed. Now, the man responsible for this song gave his okay for those truckers to use this as their rallying cry. It's too bad he died before he could find out what a lost cause it was. Yeah, breaker one nine, this here's a rubber duck. You got a copy on me, big fan, come on. Now, as it turns out, the original convoys of the 70s were also inspired by anti-government actions, specifically going against the national speed limit passed during that time. Groups of truckers would gather and purposely go over the limit together with the idea that the police, uh, aka bears, couldn't catch every single one of them so they'd be free to break the laws they pleased. And with the CB craze, they created their own language to deter the police and warn fellow truckers about speed traps and other police activity. So this song was created with the lingo and rebellion of those convoys in mind. But where in this song does this ever tell you what the convoy is rebelling against? Are they against the government, whether it's federal, state, local, all of them? Are they against their bosses who require them to keep logs about how long they drive and expect them to be honest? We tore up all of our swindle sheets and left them sitting on the scales. Are they against toll booths because they have no compunction to stop and pay any and just ram right through, possibly risking the lives of innocent toll booth workers? I says, Pig Pen, this here's a rubber duck. We just ain't gonna pay no toll. So we crashed the gate doing 98. I says, let them truckers roll 10 4. Are they against regular drivers because these jerks don't seem courteous enough to allow other cars to enter or exit freeways when their convoy is a thousand trucks long? Well, we shot the line, we went for broke, with a thousand screaming trucks. And if you would allow me just a moment of logic, how do these truckers manage to get cross-country without stopping for gas or food or sleep at any point and risk getting arrested at a truck stop? And when they finally get to their destination, what point have they made? Do they think they've influenced the public or politicians enough to change laws or opinions on their lawlessness? I know where my sympathies would lie, and it wouldn't be with a bunch of selfish, sleep-deprived, wannabe freedom fighters hopped up on Red Bull at the control of 18-wheelers going 100 miles an hour down the interstate when they think they're sticking it to the man. Ultimately, this song is just trucker revenge fantasy and proves to be as pointless and nonsensical as the convoys of 2022. Easy listening, adult contemporary, AOR, there are a variety of names for this music, and the 70s was full of these genteel acts such as the Carpenters, Bread, and many others. Music so soft, it could lull you to sleep. Music I tend to call grandmother music. The kind of music enjoyed by bitter, nasty, elderly biddies who otherwise have no fun in their lives. 
the kind of grandmothers who, when you visit them, would force you to sit on their plastic-covered furniture while they watch the 700 Club. And if they have any cookies for you, it isn't homemade chocolate chip cookies, but store-bought oatmeal raisin and not even the frosted kind because you eat too much sugar, young man. Grandmothers like this want to hear gentle, soothing pianos and violins, never any harsh electric guitars or wailing saxes. And they want to hear positive, uplifting messages and not filthy, lewd sexuality. These grandmothers are responsible not only for helping this song get to number one, but making it the biggest hit of the 1970s. Many people may forget that the song was the theme from a movie of the same name that starred Didi Khan, aka Frenchie from Greece. Her singing voice would be dubbed by Kvitka Chisik, whose biggest claim to fame would be singing Have You Driven a Ford Lately for their ad campaign in the 1980s. She was featured on the soundtrack album, but because she rebuffed the advances of the Predator, I'm sorry, I meant producer. Joe Brooks, he decided to re-record the song using the same backing track with Debbie Boone as vocalist. Boone later admitted she was forced to sing the song note for note the exact same way as Kvitka's original. Her only spin on it was to treat it less as a love song than as a Christian hymn. I mean, no less can be expected from Pat Boone's daughter. Once it reached number one, it stayed there for 10 straight weeks, which set a Hot 100 record, which would later be tied by Olivia Newton-John's physical, and later be broken by Boys to Men's End of the Road. Now, this would be Debbie's only top 40 hit on the pop charts, even though she would have success on the country charts, including a number one there. Now, this song is full of the soft sappiness that you would expect from grandmother music of this time, including the overproduced and unnecessary orchestral arrangements, to the wishy-washy lyrics, to the singing, which sounds no different than a basic American Idol audition. You basic! It's one of the ultimate safe songs, inoffensive to the point of being offensive. But once you know the behind-the-scenes story of the song and songwriter-producer Joe Brooks's crimes, which he never served any time for as he decided to take the easy way out, the song takes on a level of creepiness that lingers. And to think, this is the first number one song of the first full of American Top 40 episode that I ever listened to. It still haunts my nightmares. You grandmother music is bad, you haven't heard sentimental dad songs. You can't get more hokey, maudlin, overwrought than a father singing to or about his child. And the 70s had plenty of legendarily bad songs of this type, including Daddy Don't You Walk So Fast and Cats in the Cradle. But one such song was so bad, it was chosen as the worst song of all time in a 2006 CNN.com poll. And in this case, the child in the song hadn't even been born. You're having my baby, what a lovely way of saying how much you love me. Controversial opinion time. Paul Anka is the most overrated act of early rock and roll. When it comes to his songwriting, he's written some famous songs, including the English lyrics to My Way, the Tonight Show theme, and Buddy Holly's posthumous It Doesn't Matter Anymore. But when it comes to his vocals, I found him to be sing-songy to the point of childishness. Yeah, he was in his teens when Diana and Lonely Boy became hits, and they have this quality, but nowhere is this clearer than in his number eight hit, My Hometown from 1960. I hear a birdie up in a tree I hear him sing this melody And so he sings yeah, 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 Ugh! Although he continued to have top 40 hits, he wouldn't hit the top 10 again until you're having my baby. And I will give the song one prop. This is ostensibly a love song with a white man and a black woman singing to each other about having a child together. 
Now, you consider that Loving versus Virginia had been decided by the Supreme Court less than a decade earlier, interracial relationships were still looked down by a lot of the public. So it was a bold move to have Odia Coates as Paul's duet partner. Having said that, Odia's part sounds like a Stepford wife, which fits the patriarchal feeling of this entire song. I'm a woman in love and I love what he's doing to me. I'm a bad baby. I'm a woman in love and I love what's going through me. This was heavily criticized, and rightly so, for the male chauvinistic attitude that Paul exhibits as the song focuses on him and barely on her. The cloying arrangements are bad enough, but the lyrics aren't just sappy, they're controversial. Didn't have to keep it Wouldn't put you through it You could have swept it from your life But you wouldn't do it And gross Oh, the seed inside you, baby Do you feel it growing? Seriously, don't refer to spermatozoa as seed. This song totally turns me off of fatherhood. But I still like being a daddy. Now, I don't hate my number two choice as much as most of the other songs on my list, but I do believe it's one of the biggest disappointments of all time. Think of it this way. You're one of the greatest rock and roll stars ever. You're one of the first inductees into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Your most famous song is floating in space with the Voyager Golden Record, waiting to be discovered by possible extraterrestrial life forms. You are a rock pioneer and a legend, but you've never had a pop number one. And then, for shits and giggles, you record a novelty song during a live performance. And it gets released and becomes your only number one. A dick joke is your only number one. What an insult. We got to do our alma mater. We must do our alma mater. When I was a little bitty boy, my grandmother bought me a cute little toy. This song was met with controversy upon its release and quite a few stations refused to play it even after it hit number one. This includes deleting the song from episodes of American Top 40. A British morality campaigner tried to get the song banned on BBC Radio, claiming a teacher found a group of schoolboys with their pants down singing the songs and playing with themselves. Hmm, that doesn't sound like a made-up right-wing freakout scare, does it? Even as late as 2008, the song was being deleted from rebroadcasts of American Top 40. And the censorship of this song is just as immature as the song itself. Now, I'm not upset by the puerile lyrics, but it just makes me think back to being a horny 12-year-old and finding anything and everything with even the hint of double entendre hilarious. But it's as subtle as a hammer blow. Well, plenty of rock stars have recorded silly songs, including the Beatles' You Know My Name, Look Up the Number, or the Who's Boris the Spider. But few ever met the success of Mike Dangling. And Chuck didn't even pen the song, it was first recorded by its writer Dave Bartholomew, and there were quite a few other artists who recorded this prior to Chuck. But when he recorded this live at the Lanchester Arts Festival in Coventry, England, he managed to find the right audience who joined him in his silliness. You know that's future parliament out there singing! Does this explain Boris Johnson? I'd feel the same way as if Little Richard had remade Shaving Cream and it hit number one, or Jerry Lee Lewis going to number one with I've Got a Lovely Bunch of Coconuts. It's beneath Chuck's legacy to know the man behind Maybelline, Johnny B. Good, Sweet Little Sixteen, Rollover Beethoven, and many others could only get to number one with this. I wanna play with my Dino. But he deserved a number one, whereas the person responsible for the worst number one song of the 70s absolutely did not. But before we get to that, let's go over my dishonorable mentions. American woman, stay away from me. American woman, mama let me be. 
For a purported anti-war song, the message isn't clear, even with a line about war machines. It just sounds like a diss track from a bitter ex-boyfriend after an ugly breakup. And who wants to hear that kind of thing? Other than bitter ex-boyfriends. If you think Ray Stevens and the Streak was bad with its laugh track, well, you haven't heard grandmother music, Ray Stevens. <sighs> so much worse. Well, I got a brand new pair of roller skates. You got a brand new key. I think that we should get together and try them on to see. Be thankful that Melanie never duetted with Donny Osmond. All those poor dogs wouldn't be able to stop yowling. He's a candy man can. The candy man can cause he mixes it with love and makes the world taste good. Sammy Davis Jr. didn't even want to record the song at first, but he puts a Las Vegas spin on Willy Wonka, and it's just as bizarre as you'd imagine. Helen Reddy once complained about the repetition of the line Leave Me Alone in her hit Ruby Red Dress. But what about this? The first half of the song is fine, but that interminable chorus just doesn't end. We had joy, we had fun, we had seasons in the sun. But the wine and the song, like the seasons have all gone. The original French version written by Jacques Brel was sardonic, bitter, and defiant in its look at death. The English lyrics are a manipulative tearjerker nightmare that leaves me feeling nothing. And the cats in the cradle and a silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man of the moon. This is meant to be more sentimental dad bullshit, except he's an uncaring jerk and his son grows up to realize that his dad is an uncaring jerk and wants nothing to do with him. And as he hung up the phone, it occurred to me he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. So no, your son didn't grow up to be just like you because he cares and he wants to make sure his child loves him. It's called karma. I am music and I write the songs. So you're the one to blame for this. Good to know. If you leave it now, you take away the biggest part. Peter Cetera. An absolutely unnecessary remake with an awkward rewrite just so that a man could sing it. There was a lot of teeny bopper fluff during the 70s and this was no exception. Yeah, we did. We're at number one. The worst number one song of the 70s. And I mentioned that the man responsible for this didn't deserve to hit number one. I mean, when you think of the great acts who've never had a number one pop hit, you could talk about Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, James Brown, Joni Mitchell, the Pointer Sisters, the Cars, En Vogue, and so many others. But this man got lucky enough to make a novelty record during disco's growing popularity. And even though he couldn't get it played on the station that he was a disc jockey at, the rest of the country made up for it. So this Casey Kasem Wolfman Jack Never Will Be ended up with a number one record and a radio career that goes on to this day. And I have four words to say about that. Fuck you, Rick D. The 
basis for this abomination comes from a dance song called The Duck, recorded by Jackie Lee, which hit number 14 in 1966. I've listened to it, and I don't think it's particularly good, especially to the point where he rips off the little bit softer now part of the Isley Brothers shout. Rigdon Osmond Dees III. Yes, that is his real name, and if any name sounds like white privilege, that would, and sweet fucking shit, another Osmond? wrote this song in only one day, but it took him three months to convince anyone to perform it. I wonder if those people have taste. Even if they do, more people don't. And once it was released, it managed to sell over two million copies to make this a platinum record, and it tied for the best song on the 1977 People's Choice Awards along with Beth by Kiss. It was featured in a scene in Saturday Night Fever, but Rick D's manager decided to deny permission to use the song on the soundtrack because it would compete with Rick's record. I hope he fired that dumbass. Even if it had been included, it would have stuck out like a sore thumb with all the other classic disco songs featured on. There's so much bad on this that I wouldn't even know where to begin. The annoying pseudo-funk arrangement with its cartoonish quacking is the least of its evils. <laughs> vocals are obnoxious, especially this moment, which may be the ugliest, most irreffensive screech ever to reach number one. Look at me, I'm the disco I hate it so much. It, it, the, it flame, flames, flames on the side of my face. The duck voice doesn't sound like Donald, but yakky doodle as if Disney would have anything to do with this. I want to be historic. And then we get to the lyrics. All of a sudden I begin to change. I was on the dance floor acting strange. Flapping my arms, I begin to cluck. What's the sound a duck makes? This is fucking lame writing, forcing a rhyme because you can't think of a rhyme for quack. How about hack? In fact, you want to know how much of a hack he is? Here's how much of a fucking hack he is. His follow-up was called Disgorilla. Yeah, same stupid premise, but now he's turning into a gorilla on the dance floor. What, what other brilliant ideas could he have? Disgopher? Discomodo Dragon? Disco cockroach? You know, that one at least would fit the Kafka-esque horror of turning into a creature against your will. There are a few songs I truly loathe, detest, abhor, but this is one of them. It hits all three reasons I stated earlier for a song being bad. The production is half-assed, the lyrics are insipid, the singing is non-existent. It is skin-crawlingly awful unworthy of anything except the title of the worst number one song of the 70s. Now, was there anything that you were surprised that I didn't include? Say, Loving You, The Night Chicago Died, Billy Don't Be a Hero? Let me know in the comments your least favorite number one songs of the 70s and why I should have included it. Don't forget to hit the like button and ring the bell for future notifications. Please subscribe to my channel. I'm Gunkle Mark, and if you made it to the end, thank you for watching. And before I forget, one more thing. Fuck you, Rick Dees! <laughs>